All right, today I want to talk about Bernoulli's Law. And to do this, we're going to look at an example that you may or may not have seen before. This is incredibly typical when people start talking about Bernoulli's Law. Uh, and this is simply a, a pipe with a large diameter or a certain cross-sectional area, and fluid is flowing through that pipe. In this case, I've got a piston pushing that fluid. Now that fluid starts at a certain height and we're pushing on that piston with a certain amount of force. Now that fluid gets pushed uphill into a smaller pipe. So it's at a, a greater height and the area or cross-sectional area of that pipe is different. Uh, now if you look at 10 different videos on Bernoulli's Law on YouTube, you're gonna find this picture at least nine of those 10 times. What I wanna do is go through and explain this in a little bit different way because let's be honest, if those other videos worked, you wouldn't be watching this one. So to start our understanding of Bernoulli's Law, what I want to first look at is the work energy theorem. Where work is given by the change in kinetic energy plus a change in potential energy of some particle or some mass. Now realize all we're going to do is apply this to the situation and what will pop out down here is Bernoulli's Law. Now if you've seen any of my other videos in the past, and I don't really like looking at the work energy theorem like this, I prefer to look at it as an initial and a final state within a system. Where we have initial and final kinetic energies, initial and final potentials, and then we have these non-conservative work terms, that is work being done on the system by any sort of outside force. In this case, our force acting on this piston and our other force acting on or by this piston over here. So we've got work really into the system and work out of the system. And it's this idea of work that gets lost in how most people present Bernoulli's equation. And so that's what I wanna go through today and, and really drive home is what happens with this work and how it relates to something referred to commonly as pressure energy. So to turn this into Bernoulli's law, what I want to do is look at each term individually. So let's start with the initial kinetic energy of some particle within this fluid. If we push on this piston and cause this piston to move forward at some velocity, we'll just call it V or V1, V initial, whatever you want. That particle is going to be also moving forward at that same velocity V. So that, that particle of mass will have some kinetic energy. We're simply going to call it 1 half mv squared. And I'm gonna call this V sub one, that is the velocity over here at point one or on the initial side of this, this system that we've drawn here. Moving on to potential energy, that particle or mass of, of fluid has some height, we've given that H1, and so its gravitational potential energy is simply going to be M times G H1. Now as the particle is pushed forward by this, this piston which has some force on it, we're going to do some work on that particle or on that fluid in front of the piston. So if we look at all the fluid in front of the piston, ultimately what's happening is there's this total force F, or really F at position 1, which is going to act over some distance. I'm going to call this X1. Really this is work done on this piston or on the fluid immediately in front of the piston. Moving to the output side of this system, we have almost the same exact thing. We're going to have this piston gets pushed forward by this fluid and therefore it moves. So it has some kinetic energy. I'm going to call that 1 half mv squared with v sub 2 because that's the velocity up here at point 2 or on the outlet side of this system plus our final or outlet side potential, that's gonna be MGH, plus the non-conservative work done at this piston. So that is going to be F2, X2. Now one thing that is tempting in this problem is to go through and say that we're gonna apply Pascal's law, and that is to say we're gonna treat this like a hydraulic system where we have an input and an output cylinder. And we can't do that in this problem. I know I've drawn pistons here, uh, but ultimately what happens is once we start moving these pistons fast enough, there are shifts in pressure in this fluid as these pistons move. So we cannot apply Pascal's law and treat this like a, a set of hydraulic cylinders. But what I do want to apply in this problem is simply the continuity equation. And that is to say that if 
a certain volume of fluid or mass of fluid is pushed forward by this piston here, that same mass or volume of fluid is gonna be pushed forward up here. Now to take this equation, which is largely just based in, in general physics, and to start to apply it to fluids in Bernoulli's equation, uh, what I wanna do is take this basic idea of a force which is acting over an area of a piston and convert that into pressure. Now you'll remember pressure is given by force over area. And so what we can do is we can take this pressure term and substitute it in here and here where we have force or work being done on the fluids. Now you'll notice if I was to stop right here, what I've done is I've divided this term by A1 and that's not okay. We can't do that. Uh, just interjecting or deciding to divide one term by area, that, that's illegal math. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this, this X1, this distance which we're gonna allow this piston to move forward and we are going to multiply it by A1. So ultimately you'll, you'll see, I've divided this term by A1 and multiplied this term by A1, our area. And so I haven't committed any sort of illegal math here, but we're gonna be able to rewrite this in a very useful way in, in just a second. So writing out the right half of this equation, doing a similar sort of substitution. Now the way this sits, you could actually look at this as Bernoulli's equation, but it's a little bit useless this way. Uh, so what I wanna do is look at this term F over A as pressure. I also want to point out that this position or this length which the piston is going to move through the cylinder or tube multiplied by the area or cross-sectional area of this piston is a volume. And when we rewrite this equation we get... Now the first thing I want to point out with this is we've got to be really careful especially if you're sitting there taking notes on this stuff. Uh, writing it down, be really careful about the difference between V for velocity, I'm showing that as a small V, versus capital V for volume, like we came up with here. Now going back to some assumptions and, and constraints that I talked about earlier, we said we couldn't apply Pascal's law, that is to say the pressure in the fluid down here is going to be different than the pressure in the fluid up here. So I have a pressure here which is different from the pressure here, you can see P1 and P2, indicating the pressure is different at the two points. However, we are applying continuity to this problem, that is to say the volume of fluid pushed by this piston is equal to the volume of fluid accepted or, or that is going to push this fluid and piston forward. So our volume isn't V sub 1 and V sub 2, it's just V, the volume that is pushed by the system. Now this is the point where I want to stop and, and talk about what's going on here and get at some misconceptions that occur when talking about Bernoulli's equation. Really all we've done is we've taken the work energy theorem, turned it into the conservation of energy, and then applied some pressure to this and made it somewhat situational. We've still got kinetic energy, gravitational potential, and then there's this term. And people try to call this pressure energy. And while it is in fact referred to as pressure energy, I want you to realize this is really the work done. These pistons make the system look as though this, this system starts here and ends there. But I want you to realize there's, there's some input force here. There's energy coming in from the outside world. Now even if we remove this piston and we have fluid move on to the left here forever, at some point something has to be doing this work on this fluid and transferring pressure into the system. And so ultimately what this term is you can think of as work done on the system, or input work. And over here we have what is ultimately output work. There's work in and work out. It all just boils back to the work energy theorem and the conservation of energy. And that gets lost when people refer to this as pressure energy. I've seen people go so far as to say that the, the units of this are joules, which they are, mind you. Um, and try to reference the ideal gas law. But if we're talking about an incompressible fluid here, trying to talk about the ideal gas law with this is a little bit strange because think about it. Imagine we took a confined incompressible fluid. Like say water inside a cylinder. 
Now, if we were to take a piston and to push on that water with some force against this piston, I don't care how hard you push against this piston, if this is an incompressible fluid, you're gonna do no work as you push against this piston. You can make as much pressure in this fluid as you want with as much volume in this fluid as possible, but it is non-negotiable. You will do absolutely no work on this fluid. And so it's this idea of pressure times volume as energy that can be a bit misleading. Now, yes, if this was filled with something like, say, air, and we were to push against this piston, really all we've done is we've created an air spring. That air would compress and it would store energy. And I've got a video explaining the math behind all of that exactly right here. But the point is, is I don't want you to think that this pressure times volume is some sort of form of energy which exists within the fluid. It is work done on the inlet and work done on the outlet side of this fluid, or really the work done prior to some point we're looking at and after some point we're choosing to look at. Now getting back to deriving Bernoulli's equation, you'll almost never see Bernoulli's equation represented with masses in them. What we'll more often do is what is ultimately a, a clever unit conversion or a manipulation of the variables here, and that is to talk about not the mass of a fluid, but the density of a fluid. And you'll remember density is given by the Greek letter rho, density is equal to mass over volume. So if we were to rearrange this for mass, we can substitute this term in anywhere we see mass within this equation here. And now what we have is what well, seems like an impossibly long expression, but you'll notice the volume of fluid which we allow to flow through this system now is in every single term, and that is to say, it's going to cancel out. Which leaves us with this equation, which is often referred to as the energy form of Bernoulli's equation. What I want you to realize is the left half of this equation describes the total energy content and work done on the fluid on the inlet side here. And over here, we have the total energy content and work done on the outlet side. So the way we'll often represent Bernoulli's equation is not as an equality of before and after. The way you'll see it typically is given by this, which really just says the total energy content of the fluid is constant as it travels through this pipe. So, well, I put a cute little box around this because this is what you'll probably see in a textbook. This, this is really how we're actually going to functionally use Bernoulli's equation. So I'm gonna give it a box too. So this is Bernoulli's equation. Uh, what I want you to realize is it doesn't just apply to incompressible flow in necking pipes here. Uh, we can apply this equation to say air moving over an airplane wing. Uh, we can apply this to something like air traveling through say a carburetor or yes of course uh, you know water moving through a hose something like that uh, there's lots and lots of places to apply this uh, I'm gonna get into some examples in future videos here uh, but this is the Bernoulli's equation and on that note that's all for now